Okay, we've got some participants and everything. Hi, folks. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, let's um, let's make a start then. So we are now on session twelve of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. So we're trucking on through. We've had an excellent week last week of some really exciting talks. And uh, we had a really good session earlier as well. Um, we had um, Bethany from uh, Experience Heritage earlier on, who was talking about some really exciting stuff. And we had Bronnie McCarthy from BBC Makerbox. And their sessions are now available um, on Nord northerndigifest.co.uk forward slash uh, session recordings. So go check them out if you didn't get to see them earlier. They were really good and interesting digital tools that they were using um, and some really exciting stuff actually coming out of the BBC. But this evening we have even more excitement. So we have Shreyans here from uh, Volagra is it Volagrams is the name of the app and Vol is the name of the company. No, it's Volagrams is the name of the company. Vol is the name of the app. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I experienced this app for the first time last summer actually, and it was really quite. Co it was very cool. Um, I was playing with my pals, and um, I'm not going to tell you about the app very much because I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, but it's very much well worth getting on your phone and having a good old play with because it's a really interesting. Um, app and uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys are doing more stuff as well. So I'll, I'll I won't steal your thunder. Um, but um, yeah, my name's Heather Niven. I'm sure you all know that by now. But if not, just in case, or maybe you've got amnesia. Um, and this is Maggie, uh, my co co partner in crime, who's here in case the internet dies, and also obviously to ask questions and be interesting and informative as well. Um, and we have been planning this festival since before Christmas um, to bring you lots and lots of interesting stuff um, spanning theatre, XR, um, AI, God knows what we've been talking about all sorts over the last week. So um, it's been really exciting and we're trying to bring different folk together that maybe wouldn't normally get together uh, to have interesting conversations in these spaces in between all of these different areas um, because not only are the things that these guys are doing really interesting but there's lots of ideas pinging off uh, between panelists and speakers as we go which has been really exciting so the festival is designed to be accessible to all hi adam you're all right mate nice to see you um i'm just doing a wee intro <laughs> so just bear with me um, yep, yeah, the festival is designed to be free for all, accessible. It's live online, you're in it. And um, it's uh, also available afterwards uh, for you guys to listen to and to watch on our website, as I said earlier. Uh, before I forget, because I usually do and I end up doing it at the end, a big thank you to the Screen Industries Growth Network, who are our sponsors for the event, um, without which we couldn't run it, or we could run it, but we'd be on beans on toast for the week. Um, so, very much thank you to you guys. Big shout out to you for your support. Really um, appreciate that so as i said earlier it's a nice relaxing environment don't worry man um it's a nice relaxing environment adam so you can chill out and um relax we'll put you on second so you get a chance to catch your breath and um yeah and uh so uh, without further ado i shall introduce you to shreyans and then after that we'll have we'll hear from adam now we've got two speakers tonight rather than three because uh, I can't count and I've got four tomorrow so I'm, I'm a bit confused but never mind um, that means tonight we might finish a little bit earlier than half past seven um, because um, I don't want to interrogate these guys too much after their presentations um, but it'll be nice to have a wee chat afterwards so yeah just relax sit back um, and I'll introduce Shre Shre Shreyan sorry um, to you now so Shreyans is a marketing and growth um, manager at Volagrams, and he's a creative and analytical marketeer. He's helped companies in ed tech, dating, mm, intriguing. You're going to talk about that in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and ARVR Industries launch and grow products with product-led growth initiatives guided by market intelligence and user, uh, user behavior analytics. And his talk is going to discuss why digital storytelling needs more humans involved and what tools can you use to bring them to your story. Over to you, Shreyans. Thank you so yeah, much. Uh, introduction. introduction. I didn't do very well there. <laughs> Maybe oh, I no, I think the that was... line first. <laughs> that was great. That was great. And even the pronunciation, like Shreyans, a lot of people do not get it right. And it's generally a nice icebreaker for me whenever I introduce myself. Uh, through my name, so it's it's I've, I've created a, a a method where I do it in three goes. I go Shreyans, Shreyans, and Shreyans. So <laughs> by the third time, everyone gets it right. So thanks so much uh, uh, for the introduction and uh, the invite to the event. Um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen, and I hope I get it right. Perfect. 
Can you guys see it? Yes. Brilliant. Yes. So yeah, we're going to talk about like tools for uh, digital storytelling in AR, and I'm going to focus on one aspect of it, uh, which we'll dive into. But before getting into that, I'll quickly talk about myself. Uh, so I'm trans, uh, natively from India. Uh, I've been living in Ireland for the last three and a half years. Um, I led marketing, as, as Heather said, uh, for different companies in ed tech, dating, and direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Uh, I've helped one of the companies get acquired and uh, worked in different industries. Now, uh, I didn't study marketing during my undergrad, but studied engineering and mathematics. Uh, post which I started my career in digital marketing back in 2013 when I got an in internship opportunity. And what really made me stick in marketing was how in digital marketing I could be creative, but still measure everything to make sense of my creativity and any other tasks that we were doing, any other actions that we were performing. So that mix of creativity and numbers is something that attracted me and kept me in digital marketing. And here I am today still doing marketing, but in a little different way, but but at the, at the core, it's still being creative and um, analytical at the same time. Uh, I've also lived the life of being a co-founder uh, where I started my own direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. Um, I ran it for two years, uh, closed it after, learned a lot of things, didn't make a million dollars. But uh, I came out a little wiser, which I think is still a win. Um, and uh, apart from that, outside of work, uh, I started playing Ultimate Frisbee uh, around a year and a half ago, uh, participated in my first mixed nationals tournament here in Ireland uh, recently, and I've been enjoying playing that a lot. I never thought it's a sport that you can play competitively, always thought it's something that you just throw on the beach. But once I start playing it, it's it's pretty intense sport uh, and something I've been enjoying recently. Um, I'm also on a mission to visit the best football stadiums across EU and UK. I'm a huge football fan, uh, soccer, as you might, as some people might call it. But uh, like I'm on the mission of being the best stadiums around. Uh, recently, I was at Camp Nou in Barcelona, which was an absolutely epic visit. And uh, finally, uh, I'm not an avid reader, but uh, I've started becoming more regular at it. And I recently started reading Three Body Power Problems, uh, which is like a very good, intense mix of politics, technology, and how humans are. And uh, I'm really enjoying that book right now. It's a three-part series. So a post which, if anyone has any recommendations here, I'd, I'd love to know about similar books. Um, yeah, all that said, let's go to the reason why we are here. Uh, I want to talk about digital storytelling in AR, but before that, uh, to whoever is here, I'd like to ask a small quick question. Who or what is at the core of the content that you create and consume every day? And I don't know if I can see chat, but yeah, feel free to mention this over chat, all the attendees and even <laughs> They'll need to put it uh, in the, the Q&A people... box, I think. Um, they can put it in the Q&A box, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so people can answer it. Do I need to put the question there? No, I think they can just type in there. All right. Okay. I've been a bit shy. Can you? <laughs> Not like them. <laughs> We're going to wait for 15 more seconds. <laughs> For me, it's up. Oh, Robbie's saying the author. <laughs> Hello, <Ooh>. Olivia. <laughs> I'd say for me, it's our students. Actually, I teach, so a lot of students or, or creative businesses would be the, the core of the content that the people at the core of the content that I create. Okay. So you mean like from from your point of view, in terms of who you create it for? Is, yeah, is that what the question is? Uh, the question for about like when you consume content, what do you see or like? Who is at the center of the content that you see, or what is at the center of the content you create okay. and see? Okay. It might be a little ambiguous. I was trying to frame it the best possible way. <laughs> okay. But uh, <laughs> that said, the author, yes. The creator, yes, they are. Uh, but what I was get, getting at was humans, ah, okay. uh, people, uh, real people. 
right now any content that you consume whether it's on instagram or tiktok uh, or netflix you see real people at the center of it and it's been like that forever when like the movies that you watch have real people in it the short videos that you see the photographs that you see everything has real people in it but is that really the case in ar right now it's not uh, so for ar to move from a toy to a tool to complete totality uh, i think this is something snapchat snapchat defined it like this uh, ar really needs to be more and more realistic and it needs to have more real world content and there are three different layers to it first uh, i think developers who are creating the content right now they can't really access the technology behind getting real people in ar so capturing real people in ar is extremely expensive when you go to these massive studios with tens and hundreds of cameras and complicated and on the other hand if you don't think about capturing it in studios and want to create life like 3d characters for ar that's extremely hard as well and the results are almost always synthetic or cartoonish looking you might have seen some characters created which look like real humans but as soon as they start moving you feel like there's something wrong which is what we sometimes call the uncanny valley uncanny valley effect so you don't really like feel like you're actually talking to a real person uh, on the other hand creators the authors as someone mentioned in the q and a uh, need more options as well right now i think avatars are great but at the end i think we are social beings and we're used to interacting with and learning from real people i think creators need easier ways to bring maybe other real people their friends family celebs or even themselves to what they are creating in ar and finally uh, like i said uh, i think we learn the most from real people we get influenced the most by real people and therefore at the center of all the marketing campaigns that you see that make you buy things that make you try things are real people whether they are your favorite celebrities uh, eating the best cereal that 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 you buy from tesco uh, or anything else uh, for fan fan engagement for any kind of tourism experiences all of them feature real people now in ar only top brands can bring real people into their assets because again it's really costly uh, the accessibility is very low there are very few studios around the world or the uh, the expertise needed to do that and there's obviously lack of knowledge uh, and awareness about how you bring bring real people to ar um so how are we solving this what's the solution to all this uh, here's the solution uh, to all of that we've got at volograms we've created an app called volu that allows you to capture people from reality as they are and as they move so it's not a static model it's volumetric video but captured directly to your smartphone uh, our, our ground breaking ai also won the ogi award uh, for best use of ai in 2022 and basically it allows you to do volumetric capture directly through a smartphone which means that you don't need massive studios you only need your phone currently is ios only so you need an iphone only uh, and you can do a capture like in an in an extremely easy way which i'll talk about in a second but you don't need dozens of cameras you don't need green screens you don't need huge expertise to convert the content that you capture from different cameras into a 3d model everything is taken care of through your smartphone and it is as easy as recording a video so all you do is take your phone start recording someone like you would record a video capture them doing their movements up upload that video through our app um, and our ai takes care of the rest you also need to just record the video uh, from a single viewpoint so you don't need to go around the person and capture them from different angles because what our ai does is it estimates everything from the back it's improving every day and it's getting more accurate every day in terms of its estimation and once you upload we process it and what you get at the end is what we call a volumetric like hologram or a vologram now once you get the vologram 
Uh, you can play it inside the app. You can create content with it in augmented reality. Uh, you can you just have your digital twin or you have someone else's digital twin. You can add them to your story that you're creating. You can add it to a movie that you're creating. Um, you can add it to a game and create a game with your own self and just be experimental as, as experimental you can be. You can even integrate the Vologram into different platforms. And that is something that we've started doing recently through Volume Pro. And with Volume Pro, what we're doing is we've defined uh, and created a simple and accessible tool for everyone to create people in 3D and bring them to the platform of your choice. So you can just capture a hologram, you can just capture a video through your normal phone or through the app, uh, share that with us. What you'll finally get is a, a hologram in our own format, which is dot walls, which you can then convert it into a format that's compatible on the platform of your choice. So whether that's Unity, Unreal, Blender, uh, Eightwall, Zappar, and many other platforms. So the platform of your choice, and you can just integrate in it. It's currently in beta. Uh, you can visit our website, register, and straight away get access to it and start experimenting it by yourself. It's completely free uh, for captures as long as five seconds. You can do unlimited captures on the app, export the holograms, and bring them to your experiences as you like. Uh, we're partnering with a lot of uh, companies. We're experimenting it with a lot of people. We're experimenting it with very like various different use cases because it's still a new technology. We need to generate awareness about it, and we need to see how it fits in the production pipeline of different companies and different teams out there. Uh, we've got a lot more integrations and a lot more format support coming soon. I'll quickly talk about some of the beta partners we work with uh, in different industries to create different kinds of experiences. Uh, on the left, you see we've done a small digital uh, fashion campaign with a huge company, uh, Hugo Boss, where we created an experience to launch one of their campaigns called Reboot the Night. All the people in that campaign were captured through volume and they've been used as volumetric, like volumetric video in the campaign. Um, there are beta users trying virtual try-ons uh, through holograms as well. They're creating mini games, short games, which they are using, their friends are using uh, through different platforms. Uh, social media platforms are also using our technology to bring their users to their VA platforms, um, creating a new way to engage their audience. So you can have virtual backgrounds uh, of a different maybe TV series and people can capture their hologram and bring their hologram inside that experience to create content that they can then share with their friends and family, thereby creating a network effect, generating more awareness about um, obviously the platform and at the same time, uh, a TV series or a movie that's coming soon. Uh, a lot of companies and agencies are using holograms to create marketing activations cultural experiences and visitor engagement at uh, stadiums, museums, uh, heritage sites, uh, music uh, shows, and whatever you can think of where real people could be brought in without the need of those real people being there. So you can create a lot of immersive experiences using that. And the possibilities in general are endless. And uh, we depend on creators around the world to explore the possibilities of what's possible and anyone out there because the platform is completely free uh, I'm welcoming you we're welcoming you to join the platform uh, join volume join holograms and create your next story uh, using real people in AR probably VR or something in the metaverse as well yeah uh, that's it I'm Shreyans uh, you can connect me with on LinkedIn um, and if you have any questions about holograms happy to answer them now Happy to answer them uh, over LinkedIn as well. And uh, thanks again, uh, Heather, for the opportunity. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Shayans. That was, it's really fascinating. Uh, I remember when I first saw it and it's moved on so much actually since the, the last time I saw it as well. So I urge you all to go and have a play, uh, but not until the session's finished, then you can <laughs> have a play, uh, but you're not allowed to leave yet. Um, so what I'm gonna do, if it's okay with you, Shreyans, is I'm gonna introduce Adam. 
next and we'll have we'll hear from Adam and then we'll have a QA and a at the end um, and we can ask questions to both of you if that's all right with you. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's okay. Great. Are you okay, Adam? Nice to see uh, you. Yeah. All right. Just, just Adam, something yeah. about the late arrival. That's oh, fine. I know you're really busy. A bit of work there. Yeah, you've got tons on just now, so yeah, I it's very busy. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I appreciate you, you I'm stealing you for a few minutes in the middle of it all. You know, so Thanks. no, I've I've been following, obviously following some of the sessions. I think it's been really fascinating and really enjoyed it. And uh, I was also tying out Shleyan's uh, volumes, and that, that, that made a big impact. Uh, I, I, I had a family get together last weekend, and I was showing them all your your lap there, and they were all kind of, "Oh wow, that's amazing!" That's, you know? <laughs> that's lovely. That's good to know, Adam. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, no, no. It was, it was it's awesome, and I can definitely see that it's it's going to develop into something, you know, with many pla pla practical applications. You know, I, I'm looking forward to using it myself in some you know sort of uh, form you know haven't haven't found out yet there's so much out there at the moment um so many new things you know it seems like there's been a, a tidal wave of, it's like uh, they've unlocked ai haven't they you know and there's so many things sort of uh, bombarding us at the moment mm -hmm. and on the one side you know it feels like uh, it's a little overwhelming um because you you don't know um you know how can I use this? How can I use that? How can I integrate the, these things together? And uh, so on that side, but on the other side, it's so stimulating. You sort of find, I find myself sort of constantly going, oh, I can do this. I can do that. I'll, I'll. And so little by little, I kind of in my own way sort of form, uh, I have uses for different uh, aspects of AI. So I try not to kind of make a conscious sort of effort to sort of go out and search it. I, uh, things just cross your path or come to you and or inspire you and you go oh I can use that and that that's how how I've been sort of encountering these things um I was gonna say though Adam you tend to hang out with quite a lot of creative innovators so they you know by being a sponge around your kind of network you probably are kind of encountering it firsthand quite yeah often. no it's 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 <laughs> it's almost like uh, there's not enough uh, time in the day or you know a lifetime's not enough I'm guessing <laughs> you know uh, to keep up with all these things, uh, so I, f I find I just have to um, find what um, really appeals to me most at that moment, and what uh, what I can apply to a particular project that I'm working on, or if someone else is working on, I might suggest it to them, and I might sort of find some way of uh, working with them with uh, integrating some of this new technology. I'm not a tech person myself, not per se, although uh, because I've been in uh, television for the best part of 30 years, really, um, inevitably you sort of pick up these things. I've done various courses, of course, you know, in you know TV production and every aspect of it. I started off as, a, as an animator, actually, and uh, so I understand a lot of the kind of basic principles of these things, and they can be applied throughout uh, whatever project you're working on. Uh, you know, I find ways of kind of applying my experience, and uh, uh, it's also what I'm interested in. I, I always sort of there's this saying, my passions, because that always sounds a bit kind of <laughs> over the top creative but I suppose fundamentally that's what they are you know I, I have uh, I get excited about different things you know and uh, a little carried away going oh, oh we'll, 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 we'll do this we'll do that you know and um, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of one part of me why I was late today is I'm in the middle of a, a new project uh, working with a film student from St John uh, to create a short film but even within that short film, there's so many opportunities to use the new technology that's out there. Um, we're, we're looking at integrating some virtual uh, production techniques and things like that into it. Um, that we definitely I, I, I using I'm using more CGI than ever before. And although I would love to be able to be the person who actually creates the CGI models. And everything once again there's just not enough time to be able to do everything so i leave that to the people who have got the time and who are, are focused on those things and uh, work with them to sort of uh create new um experiences and stories mm -hmm. and um 
sorry. I was just going to say before you go on, can I introduce you? Oh sure, sure. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's okay. You're all for a roll, I'll, I'll and I'm off, thinking, I'll come back just again. leave me to it. You can just because you're going to end up introducing yourself anyway through the conversation, or do do I stop you and say, wait a minute, until I actually tell everyone who you are? That's me all over. <laughs> what can I say? Is that okay? <laughs> Please. All righty, great. So Adam is a producer and director with over 25 years experience in professional and international video production. This includes creating TV content, 360 degree video productions, virtual tours and promotional campaigns, launching and developing channels, managing budgets and mentoring talent. As well as developing brands and in international markets, he's an extensive and advanced knowledge on the on-air and online creative process. So you do do quite a lot of stuff, really, Adam. Um, after 20 years working abroad, Adam returned to the UK to establish himself as an independent video producer, and he operates under the company name of Vida Veo, I See Life, working on creative, educational and corporate films with a special interest in developing projects for heritage and education. Vida Veo's latest ventures are focusing on creating 360 films and virtual tours, but I think that's out of date now, actually, Adam. It, it is It is a little <laughs> bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm con as as we said there, uh, you know, there's so many new things coming along all the time. And so, you know, um, I, I, I really uh, brought along just some examples of a project that I was working on before um, COVID um, that we people might be interested in. Um, but uh, just to explain how I even arrived at that, uh, I, I was when I returned to England and I returned to York, I'm actually from York. Um, I uh, started looking around for what, you know, what what could be my kind of niche, you know, what could be sort of uh, special, you know, what can I, because there's many, many, many video productions and what with everyone sort of creating stuff on their phones and everything nowadays, you know, uh, you really have to sort of find a sort of niche, something special that, that's going to, but it also can't be just sort of fabricated. It has to be something that you are personally, uh, um, attached to you know you have to have a genuine kind of um uh feeling for it and and so i i started out i was thinking technology that's something uh, all this new technology and this was this was just sort of seven years or six or seven years ago and everything's changed even in this time you know in these, these past six or seven years when when i was looking at it back then um it was, you know, we we were looking at sort of uh, the development of 360 video and things like this, and I was trying to think, how can I sort of work with that? Because as uh, Shalyan was saying, um, uh, working with people and making it people-centric sort of stories is, is, is always what I've done. You know, uh, I, I've even done that through animations and things like that, even when I'm creating animations. There's, there's usually someone behind that, you know, it's based on someone, it's based on someone's experience. Uh, I'll be using real actors to do the voices and things like that. And I was quite keen um, when I returned to sort of um, use, uh, integrate people and stories uh, with technology. And uh, I started hanging out at the university, not in any suspicious kind of way, you know, but uh, going to various workshops and things like this and um, talking to the very many sort of amazing, creative and uh, technologically savvy people that I found there and um, started discussing possible projects with them. And one of them that I came up with was this. Uh, and I have to stress, this was not entirely uh, my idea at the time it was uh, Davy uh, Davy Smith was it yeah Davy Smith um, uh, he's left the University of York now uh, gone gone to better things uh, no 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 they're not better they're different um, but uh, he he, he uh, myself and Davy we were discussing these things he was heading off I said do you mind if I carry on this project and it's uh, this uh, I I dubbed it mind popping. Because the idea is that uh, you're in a kind of uh, 360 world inside a headset, but you can also view these on your phone, on the desktop, on a tablet, however you want. The most immersive way is through the headset, uh, but uh, but they have different sort of um, advantages sometimes. You know, the phone, just because it's um, handy, you know, it's literally, you know, easy for people to sort of access. Not everyone likes wearing the headset. Uh, they the 
phone, you can sort of move around like that to uh, experience the 360 um, uh, experience. Or on the desktop, it's a bit more like moving your mouse around and sort of scrolling around and looking at the environment, which is a little less kind of naturalistic, but uh, is, is perfectly functional like that. So I thought I'd just show you an example of what I'm talking about. First of all, I'll just show you a little um, video of, uh, oops, I thought I had them in order. <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, I'll just show you this, uh, this th these, uh, these videos. Whoops, there we are. I've gotten there. Zero, one. Okay. This this is an example of one of the uh, if I'll, I'll I'll put it share that in a moment. Uh, in fact, I'll share it right now. Oops. This is this is a view from inside the Oculus headset. I'll go to into full screen of that. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is just a recording direct from the headset. So if the movements are a little strange, it's because I was moving my head around because this is uh, an exact. Obviously, this would have been in 360, but uh, when it's recording, it just records a little video of, of it. And this was a, sh a short section of a, um, a, a, a few scenes that I, I shot with the idea of uh, testing the technique um, of being able to jump from the, the uh, viewer's viewpoint into the characters, into their viewpoint, where you'd hear their inner monologue, and you'd see the scene from their perspective. And you would also get, if you turn around inside their head, you get a, a slight indication, uh, an impression of what they're feeling, their emotions, their memories, uh, things that it triggers within them. So I'll just play this. Don't worry, it's just like it's less than two minutes, but it'll give you an idea of, of what it's like. We in the army, lad. The army makes a man of you. That's what young people don't understand these days. It's not about the fighting. It's not about the uniform. It's not about the weapons. It's about discipline. Discipline makes a man a man. You were in the army, were you? Well, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance. Flat feet, you see. In them days, they wouldn't let you in the services with flat feet. Crying shame. No, I was a desk warrior, <laughs> pushing paper for Her Majesty. In the war office, working with Churchill. You were in the army, were you? Well, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance. Flat feet, you see. In them days, they wouldn't let you in. That's what I thought. Feet. Just another windbag, no. letting others do the What's fighting the for him. Pushing paper for Her Majesty. In the war office, were you? Working with Churchill in the bunker. Must have been tough, that. Nothing to survive on but tea and biscuits. Listening to London being bombed while you were safe and sound underground. I was assigned to logistics. I spent the entire war in a small Scottish border village. The closest thing I got to the war was when they assigned some Italian POWs to the local church hall. Not exactly front line. Not exactly yomping around the Falkland Islands. Or staked out in Iraq, searching for weapons of mass destruction. So you're in Iraq? Me? What? No! I was an accountant. Okay, I'll stop sharing just there. Um, so that, that was just a, a, a sh short extract out of uh, what was intended to be a longer film, but the purpose of that exercise was not to create a production at that time. It was to test uh, the, the approach in a kind of real world uh, production scenario. Uh, so out on the road in quite difficult situations sometimes. And... Um, uh, also testing it using actors uh, because they, when when they're uh, visible in a 360 scenario, they 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 have to be on at all times. You know what I mean? It's it's um, they they can't they're not just saying their lines and then we cut and then we edit it together later. They the viewer can see all the actors, so even when they're not talking, um, they have to be acting. You know, it's more like a stage presentation in that sort of sense. 
And so it's quite uh, challenging for the actors uh, when we create a, um, a 360 scene, we have to, it has to be total. You know, we have to go from start to finish. And also it's add, uh, added complication is that we're shooting it from uh, all these different people's perspectives. So they have to do it again and again. Uh, and in theory, they have to do it uh, exactly the same each time. But in reality, like a stage play, for instance, it, it never quite works out that way, you know? Um, the, there's different people end up in different positions there. The, the continuity is different. They don't necessarily get their lines 100% correct. And it's actually, I found in that process, was quite interesting because it added a kind of human element into a sort of fairly sort of technical process. And actually, rather than uh, insisting that the actors got their lines co absolutely correct every time, I, I went with, uh, so long as you've got the, the, you hit certain points at it and you, the, the sentiment is correct, then that's fine, you know. Um, and I, I found that the entire kind of production process uh, very satisfying. Um, Unfortunately, this coincided with me working on this process, coincided with uh, COVID sort of happening, and I wasn't able to sort of finish those particular productions. Uh, but I can definitely see uh, applications for this uh, in a variety of ways, not just in entertainment, although I think it, it could be actually quite entertaining. Uh, but it, it could also be used in education. It could be used in uh, training scenarios. It, it can be used in heritage uh, scenarios because um, history is not just one story, is it? You know, it's 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 very different when it's seen from different people's perspectives. And I think that really that is the strength of it because it, it's a it's a different way of uh, viewing a variety of perspectives. And that's really what the mind popping um, project was about. Uh, I did have some of the videos, but I think I've probably rattled on uh, long enough. And um, I'm happy to sort of, uh, I, I'm always looking for people to kind of collaborate with. Heaven knows this, you know, I'm always sort of up for interesting projects. And I'm definitely on the look for, look out for a way, uh, an application for this particular mind hopping uh, technique. So, me, I think. See if any of our audience might know of anything, I don't know. Yeah, Thank you for that, Adam. I appreciate that. And you're working on something quite interesting right now. Are you allowed to talk about it, or would we? Ha you have to kill us. Which which one? Sorry. The latest one at Spurn Point. Are you allowed to talk about? Oh, it? oh no, I think I think I can talk about it. <laughs> like I, I think I was just saying, um, I'm working on this. Uh, it's a short film. Uh, it's with a student from. She, she's in her final year at uh, St John's uh, University. She's a film student. And it's it's a really interesting and quite challenging uh, project in itself, uh, in the sense that we're um, filming at this lighthouse, which is on a uh, on a very remote uh, causeway. It's uh, three kilometers from the land, and it floods twice a day. The causeway, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's uh, it has a kind of Stranger Things kind of feel about it. Uh, it's actually based. It came about because uh, last summer. Uh, Paula, who, who, was the, who was the student, uh, she was working with me as an intern, and we just got to talking about, uh, you know, she was she found uh, Stranger Things was really interesting, and I just happened, as I do, uh, to have a script which I wrote like 25 years ago, before Stranger Things, I didn't copy them, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not suggesting for the moment they copied me. Um, but it was sitting in a drawer and I, I dug it out, dusted it off. And between us, we've brought it up to date. Uh, Paula's uh, given it a, a kind of much more kind of modern, uh, youthful vo voice. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I was a bit more youthful, but uh, she, she's definitely she's younger now than I was then even, you know, so it's, it's but it's brought in a lot of more sort of contemporary kind of references and things. And she she's definitely working on the characters I'm working on the uh, production side of things, bringing it all together. And it's it's really exciting. We're going to be shooting that in April. Uh, we have to have some scenes out of it, at least ready for the, her assessment at the end of, or well, at the start of June. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I uh, really enjoy working on these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. And even within in that, uh, I've uh, been playing around with a lot of the apps that are out there. Uh, 
one which Heather introduced me to uh, was uh, Polycam, which uh, Shan probably knows. Uh, it's just for creating photogrammetry kind of models of um, of areas. And in this case, I was uh, we went to the lighthouse and I created a kind of reference video of. Oh, I'm, well, I'm going to try and show you it on my phone. I know this is not <laughs> possibly the best way. Of it. <laughs> but but uh, for instance, uh, let me get this. Oops, get this up as much as I can. This this uh, strange vehicle here. Uh, we we created this using. Oh, you can see it's got a hole in the top because I literally just walked around it. Let's try it with uh, volume next time. Yeah, yeah. You well, get the sound effects of it of it running at the same time. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's it's very high quality, and I know I know it's I this is just a reference, mm -hmm. but uh, in this vehicle we're going to use within the as part of the film actually you know so it was a good way of just capturing something whilst I was on site. Mm -hmm. uh, it literally took me just the time it took me to walk around the vehicle, mm -hmm. and now when I'm talking to like the props people, to the actors, to the lighting people, I can say this is this is the vehicle, mm -hmm. and they can see exactly what I mean. And um, I took an inside of the lighthouse as well. This one looks very crude, sorry, <laughs> okay. but it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll blow it up a little bit. It looks very crude, but in actual fact, it's it's a, a photogrammetry model. And I'm not suggesting for the moment that these are good enough to use within the production. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the good thing is I can talk to the lighting people. I can talk to the actors and say, you're going to be standing on that sort of platform there. The other person's down there. And these are the views around you. And so it's it's a very useful tool mm -hmm. for production. And that's what I mean. There's there's just endless amounts of things coming up. Some are kind of, I see them as practical tools. So this could be integrated into the actual production as well. If if I decided to use a you know higher resolution cameras, DSLRs, and so on for capturing the environment. And there's just so much out there. Uh, I, I also use the AI kind of all, all the various types of AI that are available at the moment, as much as anything, just for the inspiration. If if I'm if I'm stuck, well, not even stuck necessarily. I'm just searching for an idea, mm -hmm. and I want to look at it in a in a fresh way. And there's not all you, you don't always have the luxury of having a group of people around you to bounce ideas off. I, AI is actually very good at that. You know, you can just sort of say, "Hey, how about this?" Mm -hmm. And it comes back with, "Oh yeah, what do you That's think?" That's amazing, that? Adam. You should totally do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good use of AI to me. But yeah, I yeah, what, no, actually, Bright Black came up with a good idea for it um, in one of their previous sessions, and that was around if you are working in Unity um, and you're not a C sharp coder that actually you can use um, AI to write your code for you so you can explain what it is you want it to achieve. And they were saying, you know how you get the, you just get the cubes in Unity at the beginning, your sort of step one um, tutorial is make a cube in the, you know, you can literally get something like chat GTP to like, th throw 15 cubes into the scene and it will write the code and chuck them in. So actually, you know, thinking about what you're doing with Volu um, and being able to import your holographic people into something like unity and then using chat gtp4 to then generate code around that to do something with it that actually suddenly the combination of these digital tools is becoming quite interesting you know combining the ai with the unity with with volu together you could come up with something quite exciting actually yeah no no i i i'm really enjoying it and uh, like i say it's a little overwhelming but there's so many, it opens up so many more possibilities. Totally. Well, thank you for that, Adam. Thanks for sharing your projects. It's really interesting. Um, and I recognize that Priory, that your uh, backdrop was there. <laughs> I used to live there, <laughs> not in the Priory, right. but just opposite um, a little cottage across the road. So it was nice to see it again, actually, a bit nostalgic. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Are you guys up for some questions? Sure. Yeah, fab. The right answer. Okay, so Olivia's got one for you, Shreyans. Will, vol will volograms look to expand beyond humans? What about pets? Yeah, if, if I think we had a penny for every time that was asked, we would be like a self-surviving company for years to come. Uh -huh. uh, I think that's one of the most asked questions, even on our Discord or on our Twitter. Uh, but unfortunately, like all the data that uh, our AI has been trained on is human data. 
So because our AI has only been trained on humans, um, when you capture animals, it will give you some results. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might give you decent results as well. And I'm quickly going to share my screen to show you guys something. Mm -hmm. um, one of the users did try capturing their dog. And this is what came of it. That's not bad. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. So um, it, it is not <laughs> even with a little not recognize the fact that there is a character or creature that has four legs mm -hmm. because humans only have two legs <laughs> and uh, it does not uh, understand that there is a tail as well. Our algorithms don't understand there is a tail. So you always see flickering around the tail. Um, it's but, pretty good, yeah. though, eh? It is. It's pretty yeah, good, isn't it's pretty it? Pretty good. And you got your shadow out. It's jumping. You know, that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it's it's very good. good. Let me yeah, put it on full screen again. Yes, you've got the shadow as well. Yeah. Nice. Uh, <laughs> You're gonna get so many. You're gonna get so many um, images of folks' dogs now coming through. <laughs> I, I, was, I was gonna say, can I show you? Can I show you my sister's dog? I don't think I, it's no. It's it's on the phone. But uh -huh. if I can go on, if if uh, if we can stop sh uh, sharing, yeah. there we go. There we go. Um, whoops. This this again was done on the poly poly. Oh, that's poly. lovely. But look, it's so it's so well done, isn't it? Yeah. And and the, he was he was kept in his place by uh, his blue. attention was kept by a ball on the beach. <laughs> Sorry, you know. no glue. But, but but really, it's it's amazing, you know, that even you know if you're getting really close, yeah. the detail on on the on the paws and things oh, like that on the yeah. air. You know, it's just amazing, and and I imagine that your volumes at some point are going to sort of, you know, be that precise, that quality. You know, and, uh, yeah. so I'm really looking forward to that. You know. Fingers, fingers well. crossed. Fingers crossed. I think that's going to be like a huge breakthrough once we start capturing pets like that. I think people yeah. themselves like pets more than people. It's so true. I think we'll it's find true. a bigger use case once we start allowing people to. Um, yeah, yeah. Capture pets I, th in I think you need to prioritize that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to pass this message to the team. But I, I think Polycam does a really good job, and even Luma AI. Uh, that's that's a really good app. Um, they do a really good job in capturing uh, things, or even objects, or people, or uh, animals in static. Mm -hmm. So if you just want a static 3D model of anything. Uh, these apps like Polycam and uh, Luma can do a really good job at it, but uh, uh, yeah, yet to find something that can capture. Yeah, for, for, for instance, um, we, I, when I was at the location of the lighthouse that we were talking about, I tried to do a Polycam of the lighthouse itself, but it, it didn't come out very well because the AI had a bit of trouble because it was such a sort of regular cylindrical kind of object. I think it just didn't know where to stitch things together. But what it did do was it gave me a, a, a good rough model that I was able to, uh, I was working with a CGI um, a designer and he'd already sort of created um, a model of the lighthouse. But the good thing was that using the reference from the polycam, he was able to sort of match up, you know, oh, there's a window at this point, window at this point, you know, which would have been quite tricky, just them a, a, a bunch of photos. Mm -hmm. And so integrating the kind of technologies in that way is very, mm -hmm. is, I think it's good, just going to get more useful as time goes on. Mm -hmm. well, that's, true. that's a very good use case, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got some more questions for you guys, if that's okay. Um, so from Robbie to you, Shreyans, how long until adverts don't include real people? Yeah, um, like just before that, uh, so with Volu, you can always try to break the algorithm. So if you want to capture your pets, do try capturing your pets. Sometimes you'll get strange results like this. One of our um, uh, team members, he tried capturing his cat. Uh, he held his cat near his chest and captured a hologram. What we got at the end was a massive black hole near his chest because <laughs> the algorithm did not recognize that there is a pet and how our pet's supposed to look, but uh, definitely try something and, and, and see how it comes yeah, out. Totally. I'm definitely. Uh, sometimes the results that. are surprising even for us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> These guys are going to be out scanning all sorts. We'll be just going around random parks and finding folks' pets. <laughs> <laughs> Everything possible. Like break the system. 
that's that's what we go by break the system <laughs> we'll, we'll report back when we've done our homework <laughs> yes. so back to the question from rob yeah. to you how long until adverts don't include real people yeah uh, but that's a really good question um i think so like if i take a step back from that question and look at advertising as what it is and the purpose that it serves and who actually does advertising so people and companies do advertising to sell products uh, or sell an idea or something that brings value to the company at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, advertising at the end, marketing at the end is all about ROI. Um, why do companies bring uh, the biggest personalities and biggest celebrities into their ads? It's because they believe that getting those people in those ads can generate the ROI for them if they do an ad with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know when exactly ads will not have real people, but as soon as you start seeing avatars generating the kind of ROI that marketers and advertisers need from any advertisement that they create, you will start seeing that switch. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen five years down the line. It might happen in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, can I can totally imagine avatars becoming, you know, personalities in their own right. Mm -hmm. You I think know, they already are actually. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. We were talking about that the other night about we're around AI actually, and just yeah, <laughs> how, how are you going to know the difference at what soon? You know, you're probably not. <laughs> okay, so Adam, a question for you: um, How do you account for nausea created um, or caused by the use of the VR headsets? Have you had to, had to deal with that at all with the stuff you've been doing? Uh, well, there's there's a lot of people kind of wary of using the VR headsets. And I think a lot of it is uh, just apprehension. Uh, you know, I'm not saying there's not something, you know, because obviously there's a slight sort of, uh, some people get motion sickness just from being in a car, you know, obviously. So these these kind of, that kind of level, uh, I don't know that you'll get over that, you know. Um, but the technology has improved a lot over the last few years. Um, the reason that initially that uh, it caused it was what they call latency. It's the delay between you moving your head in the headset and the image catching it up. So it gives you that slightly kind of queasy feeling of, whoa, things aren't quite in, in sync. Yeah. And um, so that, that, that's, that can be a cause of it. Um, the, it can also be slightly because uh, I've got glasses on now, but when I'm wearing the headset, I don't wear uh, glasses. I don't need to, but some people still do. And that slightly kind of, uh, you know, the, the heavy uh, effort, the strain that it's putting on your eyes can also make you feel, you know, sort of a little unwell, you know, whether it's a headache or it's whatever. So there, there are definitely sort of limitations in the current um, uh, way that we view things in VR. But I, I, as you probably all know, that there, there's various people talking about different kind of more lightweight uh, sort of versions of it. Uh, you can experience uh, VR in a physical space using projections as well. And uh, that that's uh, for people who can't wear the headsets. That, that can be, you know, but you have to find a place that does that. You can use the phone, as I said earlier, you know, for viewing them. But it's it's really that latency. What you saw on the recording earlier, the delay in the audio and the video, that, that's not because of the headset. That's just because of the way the recordings are made from the from the headset. You know, it, when you're actually viewing it, the uh, audio is in sync with the <laughs> production. Thank you. That's great. So Shlomi's got a question for you, Shreyans. Uh, she says, congratulations. She loves the simple accessibility of the product. What is the common use case for consumers so far? Is it social, presentations or AR? Uh, that's a very good question. And it's something that uh, we've been exploring with so many users for a while as well, because the technology is so new, uh, not just in terms of uh, like the ecosystem as a whole, with AR and VR, but also in terms of consumers starting to use it, we're seeing varied uh, use cases popping up in uh, different segments, whether it's social in terms of content creation, whether it's uh, creating uh, VR experiences or AR experiences inside museums, inside heritage sites, mm -hmm. whether it's about creating fan experiences inside a stadium, uh, whether it's doing digital fashion related things, uh, whether it's virtual production 
uh, in a studio as well. So you we're seeing varied, varied use cases and people in different industries are trying volumetric video and volograms for different use cases. It's, it's like video. There's no single use case that we can define for it. Uh, it it's up to the people to try it and come up with new experiences. Um, and there's no single or like a list of use cases that I can talk about. Everyone who tries it, tries to do it in a different uh, way, if that answers your question. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got another one for you, Adam, from Olivia. Okay. Uh, what techniques have you found the hardest to use in VR? Have you used gaze interaction or even eye tracking? Um, I haven't applied that to any of my um, the, the, the productions that I've done, but I have, I've, I'm certainly looking into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I, I definitely, I don't, I don't see any problems with it. I've, I've tested it out, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's once again, it's down to the sort of headsets and things like that. You know, if you've got the headsets that can accommodate those uh, kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, and and obviously the software, you know, because it has to be prepared for it. Um, I quite like uh, using just the handsets for clicking things. It seems like a very kind of natural, intuitive thing to sort of be picking things off the screen. Mm -hmm. And with the eye gaze, um, sometimes you inadvertently sort of activate things that you didn't intend to just because you're kind of staring at it kind of blankly and sort of vacantly. And, and it will, it'll just, you suddenly go, oh, <laughs> I wasn't really looking for that, you know. Whereas I find the, the handsets are much more kind of positive kind of of interaction um I, th I think that's all i can really say about that i am trying to build i am trying to find ways I, i'm not trying to put programmers out of a job but programmers uh, are probably the most expensive aspect of uh, the process the production process for the uh for virtual experiences and um I am looking at kind of trying to find ways to sort of minimize the the work of the processor. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, at the moment, they're just so much they're so high in demand mm -hmm. that they can they 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 can uh, charge really high prices, understandably. And uh, it just puts it out of uh, the many people's budgets. And um, I, 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 I work on relatively small projects. You know, I'm not doing these sort of uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds or, or even millions of pounds, which some people spend on on these big projects. Um, and so uh, I, I have to be very tight with my my sort of how I spend my budget and things like that. So I'm, I've been looking at sort of um, what do you call them? not not shortcuts, workarounds. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at workarounds. You know, I can use this part of this project. Uh, uh, um, bit of software and this bit of this bit of software and I can bring them together, them together and, yeah. yeah and once again if you've got the time to research those things and it, again if you build up a bit of a network of people who have that kind of can do uh entrepreneurial innovative kind of way of thinking then uh you you can actually co sort of create quite unique uh, productions mm -hmm. cool which you do often. <laughs> okay, one for you, Shreyans. Uh, what's the greatest challenge you have encountered when working with AR to date? <laughs> Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, I think with AR right now, uh, what I feel is a, a, one of the barriers to widespread adoption of AR is distribution. Um, I think most of the experiences created out there require you to install an app, which is a friction when it comes to getting people to consume that content. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've seen web AR becoming extremely popular lately, but again, that has its limitations. It has its, its limitation in terms of uh, the, the streaming speed at which you can download the 3D data that you've, you've created, which are heavy files, uh, and you can't really stream at that speed so that, uh, as Adam said, there's no latency there. Uh, you want to be able to see something in real time. You skip through your Instagram reels and TikTok videos the moment something is not loading or turn off the app 
uh, we've become peak people like that. We don't even want to wait for seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and because all the data, all the content that's created for AR and VR has these 3D models, which are heavier files, mm -hmm. uh, streaming of that data over your normal internet speed sometimes does not happen, uh, either due to the fact that uh, the distribution platforms do not allow that or your internet's not that fast. But there are different aspects of the ecosystem that need to evolve in order to, in order for distribution to become easier. And as soon as distribution becomes easier, as soon as consumption of, of the content that we have becomes easier, I feel the adoption of technologies that create content in AR or probably the, that allow you to spread content in AR will increase the value. And do you think 5G will help that? Or do you think, is it going to be like high-speed broadband Wi-Fi connection in order to oh. be able to consume that? No, definitely. I think 5G will help that as well. At Volograms, we've been uh, testing volumetric video uh, captured through volume uh, from 5G as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results are different. Uh, the results are better. You mm -hmm. see the Volograms getting streamed at a better rate of more real time. And uh, that kind of thing really helps. Uh, I think 5G has its own drawbacks in terms of how far it can go, but in terms of speed, it can definitely try to uh, like, yeah, solve that issue. Okay, so watch this space. Okay, Adam, uh, what challenges have you encountered when working in an interdisciplinary team, if any? Uh, well, it's, it's I, I, I've always worked with uh, kind of uh, quite uh, eclectic groups of people. You know, I've, I've had to work with uh, purely creative people, artists, and uh, I've worked with highly technical people. Uh, I've worked with people who work on a very sort of strict production sort of basis and other people who kind of have a more kind of um, uh, open approach to sort of uh, the to uh, productions. Um, working with... Uh, I, I, I keep on top as much as I can with new technology, even if I, I'm not an actual kind of um, a technician. I, I, it's important that I understand what's out there and uh, understand some of the terminology that they're using, you know. So um, I, so long as you're sort of fairly open about it and uh, open to asking questions when you don't understand something, don't worry about sounding a bit stupid you know <laughs> I, I i frequently put myself in that position and um it's it's you have to you know because uh this as i've keep mentioning there's so many new things that you you you've got to have that kind of inquisitive mind and you've got to be constantly asking questions about you know what does this do what can it do you know and as uh, shreyan was saying earlier it's it's also uh has anyone tried that you know and why if not why not and mm -hmm. shall i try it you know <laughs> um and uh quite often people uh, i've been in this situation i've been in the op opposite side of it as well um uh you 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 hear people say oh no it can't do that you know or no it's not made for that mm -hmm. um but in actual fact if if you do push it you'll find something new you know it may not be pretty the first time then uh but um it it'll be there'll be something a nugget of something which you can then sort of uh, nurture and grow it's almost like by having the interdisciplinarity there you know you, you can break things more easily um or try things that maybe you're thinking outside the box i often That's say true. that you know you know more brains make light work really if you ask the same people the same questions you'll get the same answers whereas mm. if you bring like a diverse team together with different skill sets and, certainly, certainly. and experiences then you know you'll absolutely get a much more innovative response or creative response and, and these new technologies they're bringing in a whole different uh, range of people and I'm I'm not just sort of saying, oh, it's a younger generation or something like that. It's just a, a different section of society who are now sort of finding that they're they're front and center, you know. <laughs> They've got the stage now. And uh, you know, uh, they they may, you know, they they've got plenty of new things for us to explore and play with. Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? And a wee bit scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shreyans, uh, what is the best platform you have found to integrate Volograms into, or the Volu, Volu app sort of products into? Oh, um, so I think it like really depends on where exactly you want to create your experience and 
uh, where exactly you think your at the end again audience will enjoy consuming that content like i said with advertising as well it depends at the end on uh, who's consuming it and if that advertisement is having an impact mm-hmm. um, even with the content that you're creating using bolograms if you think uh, people like web ar has the most widespread widespread adoption uh, combining that with web ar might give you the best results if you think you have an app already uh, which runs on unity and integrating bolograms can help you create a better user experience then it's unity if you want it's unreal so it completely depends on what exactly you're trying to sell to people um, where exactly do you think your customers or users might find value and um, we're building as many as integrations as we can and uh, potentially will allow you to integrate in your platform of your choice and just a quick techie question what file extension do you normally import in as so uh, we have our own file extension it's called dot walls uh, and then on top of that we've built open like uh, open source code and we've built plugins that allow you to integrate uh, or change the file format into file formats that are compatible in unity and real and at the same time our users have been creating plugins as well so one of the users has created a plugin that allows you to do integration in web ar uh, and different platforms so we're building our own things and at the same time because it's open source people are building their own plugins to integrate into the platform of their choice. Yeah. that that was for you by the way olivia just so you know <laughs> okay a couple more questions and then we'll wind up so a question um for you again shrayans from uh shlomi any plans to move beyond circular movements to diverse actions activated by users or not uh, so i think i'm sorry i didn't get that completely that's okay uh, any plans to move beyond circular movements to diverse actions activated by users does that mean in terms of i know that when you first capture it you've got to kind of move around and dance is that what you mean shlomi see if he comes comes back yeah yeah okay so uh like on on volume again uh volumetric video or volume allows you to capture people as they are so you can do any kinds of movements that you like uh, you can try to be static you can do different movements we've seen people capture doing moonwalks as well so uh, it does break sometimes it might not give you the best quality with certain kinds of really fast movements we've got a cheat sheet um and a list of tips or tips and tricks inside the app that you can look at to get the best results um but pretty much any movement that you would like to do um you can do on it whether it's moving your hands moving your legs moving your head um the result might not be the best in certain cases but again if you understand the tips and tricks uh and try capturing it again you will get a, a good result with any kind of movement that you like the idea is to capture people as they are and as they move so that mm-hmm. when you integrate it in probably the experiences that adam is creating you do not feel that you are talking to uh Uh, not a human uh, mm-hmm. and i think our brains are wired in such a way that even if you see slight anomaly in how a person is moving even their shoulders or their head we'll be able to catch that and we'll start feeling strange inside it mm-hmm. uh, like adam said uh, even a little bit of latency can make us feel nauseous uh, similarly in the uncanny valley even if there's a slight difference in the movement of a certain person you'll realize it uh, and therefore a uh, volumetric video acts as a way for you to capture people in their real self and real form doing real things mm-hmm. now shlomi's come back with interactivity question mark and i'm wondering what you mean by that do you mean people should be dancing together or someone would shake your hand or you know bear in mind that this is like an ai generated not sorry not ai an ar generated uh, figure shlomi what do you mean in, in terms of that that an, an actual person can interact with the ar element um so i don't so we don't have real time uh you cannot like create real time holograms to create interactivity inside an experience like that what you can have is you can record holograms doing certain things and then create an experience to unlock those certain things so you can capture a hologram waving at you and then when you tap on a button inside the experience it will wave at you okay. um, you can capture a hologram 
um, again, like for the lack of a better example, doing moonwalk and uh, you can tap on a button and the hologram will moonwalk in front of you okay. or read a poem to you or like do whatever you like. But you'll have to record the hologram before integrate it into the experience because we're a little farther away from making all this real time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Hopefully that answered your question, Shlomi. Okay, one more question and then we'll wind up. So what impact has generative AI had on your work, if any, so far? And where do you think it's going to go? Uh, that last wee bit was from me, by the way. <laughs> oh, to, to, to anyone, is it? Yeah. Uh, by generative AI, you mean all, all these various things that sort of create something from nothing, basically? Or, 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 or basically help with the workload. So um, yeah. whether it is, you know, adding something in programming I, wise. Or... I, I, I had a very strange example of that the other day. Uh, I was working with an artist and um, we wanted to create a 360 aquarium because the artist was uh, creating uh, fish using plasticine uh, as a kind of art medium, not, not sculpting them, but using it as a kind of paint almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was bringing these fish to life, as it were, and, and I filmed an actual aquarium using the 360 camera in an aquarium. Oh, wow. And uh, I, th I then animated some of these uh, fish inside that aquarium. So they were just swimming around, you know, and you, you, in theory, uh, if we develop this further, you'll be able to interact with them a little bit. You'll be able to sort of find out some information about and things like that. Um, and uh, we were also talking about she wanted to do it in a uh, create a, an ex exhibition in an art space and with the actual original artwork so you could see it, there would be a space where you could uh, interact uh, as a member of the public, you could create your own artwork using the same processes. And then there was going to be an area where you'd walk into it and it was a 360 area with projections all around you with these fish sort of moving around you. And uh, I was saying it would be nice. I was we were just talking about it and I was saying it would be nice if there was a, you know, some kind of poetry reading or something about your artwork here. Mm -hmm. And I, this was an exchange on email. And I just I just said that would be really nice, you know. And with it literally within two minutes, she bounced back this this full poem about the artwork and about standing amongst the fish in this sort of space. Mm -hmm. And it was actually very good. And I, I I was going, where did you get that? It was it was AI chat, you know. All right, okay. It was actually super good. <laughs> you know, and just going, oh my God. It just needed a few little tweaks to it. You know. Now bear in uh, mind, Maggie's a poet, so be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it was it was frightening good, you know, because I was going, How on earth did you get something that was just fitted so well that, you know, and it was there, you know, and it it was nice, it, it made sense. Mm -hmm. It, it was uh, reasonably yeah, lyrical. Right. Yeah. Cool. Very good. When's this show coming on? Uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly. That uh, um, that that particular uh, show uh, was more of a kind of test piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, she's got more ideas about you know different shows actually, but we're we're hoping to work together on. Them. Cool. Watch this space. What about you, Shri uh, Shri 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 Oh God, get my teeth in straight. <laughs> Shrey hands even. I think Shrey, Shrey, Shrey works as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, generative AI has been uh, helpful. Like as, as uh, from a marketing point of view, as a marketer point of view, in my day-to-day -day tasks, I think something it's made really easy is getting first draft of multiple things that I'm doing, whether it's uh, copywriting, whether it's writing an email whether it's defining templates for inbound, outbound emails. Uh, it's made it really easy for me to have, like, like copywriting in general has become easier um, as compared to what, what it was before. And you could really play around with the copy by just asking ChatGPT to be more persuasive, more friendly, more professional, mm -hmm. and get various different kinds of drafts mm -hmm. and then build on that, obviously. But the first part of, where, where you need to be extremely creative, especially because like I've, I've studied English almost all my life, but again, I'm, I'm not a proper native English speaker. It's always really nice to 
get copies in English as a base, and then I can work on that. So uh, copywriting is something that uh, generative AI has made my life really, really, really easy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it knows Gaelic. <laughs> I'll try that at some point and see if it can translate it into Gaelic. <laughs> anyway, that's me. I digress. Okay, I think we've probably interrogated you enough. That's twenty past seven, and I promised you I'd let you go early. So you've only you're, I'm only letting you go ten minutes earlier than if you'd had three speakers. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, but it's just been the chat's been so good. So. And um and the question, sorry, Robbie, I haven't managed to ask them all, but you've been going great guns as always. I um, appreciate that. So um so thank you very much, guys. I really enjoyed that. Um you you talked about different types of digital tools and free ones and ones that maybe some bits cost, but some bits you can hack together. Um and, and the way that you work in terms of bringing different types of tools together into a space. Um you've got inspired us with ideas around mind hopping as well as um you know, we're off to generate our, our pet and <laughs> involve you after the after the uh, session. Yes. Well, I certainly am anyway. Um, go we'll catch my dog. <laughs> I can scan her. <laughs> share the results. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing. I'm going to send it to you. Share, share yes. it. Yeah, totally. So, so yeah, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate your talks, and I think you're both coming back to join us again, aren't you? Are you? Shreya, yes, you are. definitely are. You're coming back to join us. Are you, Adam? I don't, I don't think so, not as far as oh, okay. I know. But, oh, but I could be wrong because it's been... It's well, we'll been check. I, I, I was going to say, because I've run, I'm running 59 speaker sessions over two weeks, so I could maybe have got it wrong. But I know you're definitely joining us again. Is it tomorrow or the next day? Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, fair. Okay, great stuff. So yeah, look forward to that. And um, yeah, we've got loads more. Uh, tomorrow we're looking at the metaverse and digital storytelling around empathy and VR. Um, so we're going to have um, HTC Vive, uh, Josh Naylor joining us to talk about some of the new technologies that are coming through HTC. Um, that's at lunchtime tomorrow. We've got Richard England from Reflex Arc, who will be talking about the technologies he's working on. Um, and we've also, I can't remember who the third person is, but we'll have another surprise person as well. I think it's Simon Benson, actually, Talent for Tech. Um, so we've got quite a techie um, crowd at lunchtime tomorrow. I'm talking about VR and how you use that around and, um, creating empathy so uh, if you get a chance join us for that and you can book your tickets on the website if not the recording will be on the on the session recordings tab afterwards so um, so join us for that but anyway thank you guys for your uh, contributions tonight I'm really interested okay. to hear about I'm sure everyone will be running off to download our volume straight after this um, and also be keeping in touch with you Adam as to how you're getting on with your latest film and you know it'd be great I can't wait I've heard quite a lot we had Bethany on earlier who's helping oh, right, yeah. them so she is she is yeah yeah, so so it's great to see it coming together, and I have supported it on Indiegogo. If you want, to I saw that. Watch. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, uh, it's crowdfunding some aspects of that film. So uh, where can see, see Glass Film? Just look up Sea Glass Film on. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, Sea Glass Film Indiegogo. plus Indiegogo. It's Indiegogo. It's on, isn't it? I. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So so go go support your local talent, guys. Um, if you can, um, it'd be really great if you can support that. So um, thanks to our audience again, uh, and for our questions. Uh, you have been absolutely amazing in terms of the questions you've come up with over the last um, however many sessions, 12 sessions. So keep it, keep up the good work. Um, thanks again to our sponsor, Sign, for um, supporting the event, um, without which we couldn't do it. And we'll see you guys, hopefully, uh, later in the week, um, either on the panelists or in the audience. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Maggie. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.